to the dread familiar. It is sometimes an appropriate response to reality to go insane. Philip K. Dick This is episode number 13. Thanks for listening to the show. As always, if you'd like your story to be read, or if you'd like to read a story on the show, or do both at the same time, send your stories and voice auditions to submissions at thedreadfamiliar.com. So far, this show has consisted entirely of fiction, but I am also happy to consider stories of true personal accounts of horror. I had planned on this episode 13 being the last episode of the season, but I misremembered the length of the story I'm in the middle of reading, and I failed to run a word count. So, there will be one more episode in two weeks, after which I'll take a few months off to collect new stories and write new music for season two. So, now is the time to submit if you want to be featured on season two. Tonight, I'll be continuing Walter Gilman's Descent into Madness in the second part of The Dreams in the Witch House by H.P. Lovecraft. This is part two of the story, which will now be read in three parts. If you didn't hear part one, I humbly request that you go back and check it out before this episode. One, because you'll be starting in the middle of the story, but more importantly, because I want my motives for reading Lovecraft, whose stories contain some racist and xenophobic content, to be understood. So please go back to episode 12 if you haven't already heard it. That being said, I'll jump right into Dreams in the Witch House. We join Walter Gilman, living in the room once occupied by the witch Keziah Mason, and her human rat familiar Brown Jenkin, his dreams becoming constantly more vivid, disturbing, and real. During the night of 19 through 20 April, the new developments occurred. Gilman was half involuntary moving about in the twilight abysses with the bubble mass and the small polyhedron floating ahead when he noticed the peculiarly regular angles formed by the edges of some gigantic neighboring prism clusters. In another second he was out of the abyss and standing tremulously on a rocky hillside bathed in intense, diffused green light. He was barefooted and in his night clothes, and when he tried to walk discovered that he could scarcely lift his feet. A swirling vapor hid everything but the immediate sloping terrain from sight, and he shrank from the thought of the sounds that might surge out of that vapor. Then he saw the two shapes laboriously crawling toward him, the old woman and the furry little thing. The crone strained up to her knees and managed to cross her arms in a singular fashion, while Brown Jenkin pointed in a certain direction with a horribly antipoid forepaw, which it raised with evident difficulty. Spurred by an impulse he did not originate, Gilman dragged himself forward along a course determined by the angle of the old woman's arms and the direction of the small monstrosity's paw, and before he had shuffled three steps he was back in the twilight abysses. Geometrical shapes seethed around him and he fell dizzily and interminably. At last he woke in his bed in the crazily angled garret of the eldritch old house. He was good for nothing that morning, and stayed away from all his classes. Some unknown attraction was pulling his eyes in a seemingly irrelevant direction, for he could not help staring at a certain vacant spot on the floor. As the day advanced, the focus of his unseeing eyes changed position, and by noon he had conquered the impulse to stare at vacancy. About two o'clock he went out for lunch, and as he threaded the narrow lanes of the city, he found himself turning always to the southeast. Only an effort halted him at a cafeteria in Church Street, and after the meal he felt the unknown pull still more strongly. He would have to consult a nerve specialist after all. Perhaps there was a connection with his somnambulism, but meanwhile he tried at least to break the morbid spell himself. Undoubtedly he could still manage to walk away from the pole, 
so with great resolution he headed against it and dragged himself deliberately north along Garrison Street. By the time he had reached the bridge over the Miskatonic, he was in a cold perspiration, and he clutched at the iron railing as he gazed upstream at the ill-regarded island whose regular lines of ancient standing stones brooded sullenly in the afternoon sunlight. Then he gave a start, for there was a clearly visible living figure on that desolate island, and a second glance told him it was certainly the strange old woman whose sinister aspect had worked itself so disastrously into his dreams. The tall grass near her was moving, too, as if some other living thing were crawling close to the ground. When the old woman began to turn toward him, he fled precipitately off the bridge and into the shelter of the town's labyrinthine waterfront alleys. Distant though the island was, he felt that a monstrous and invincible evil could flow from the sardonic stare of that bent, ancient figure in brown. The southeastward's pole still held, and only with tremendous resolution could Gilman drag himself into the old house and up the rickety stairs. For hours he sat silent and aimless, with his eyes shifting gradually westward. About six o'clock his sharpened ears caught the whining prayer of Joe Mazurowicz two floors below, and in desperation he seized his hat and walked out into the sunset golden streets, letting the now directly southward pole carry him where it might. An hour later darkness found him in the open fields beyond Hangman's Brook, with the glimmering spring stars shining ahead. The urge to walk was gradually changing to an urge to leap mystically into space, and suddenly he realized just where the source of the pole lay. It was in the sky. A definite point among the stars had a claim on him, and was calling him. Apparently it was a point somewhere between Hydra and Argonavis, and he knew that he had been urged toward it ever since he had awakened soon after dawn. In the morning it had been underfoot, and now it was roughly south but stealing toward the west. What was the meaning of this new thing? Was he going mad? How long would it last? Again mustering his resolution, Gilman turned and dragged himself back to the sinister old house. Mazurowix was waiting for him at the door and seemed both anxious and reluctant to whisper some fresh bit of superstition. It was about the witch light. Joe had been out celebrating the night before, and it was Patriot's Day in Massachusetts, and had come home after midnight. Looking up at the house from outside, he had thought at first that Gilman's window was dark, but then he had seen the faint violet glow within. He wanted to warn the gentleman about that glow, for everybody in Arkham knew it was Keziah's witch light which played near Brown Jenkin and the ghost of the old crone herself. He had not mentioned this before, but now he must tell about it because it meant that Keziah and her long-toothed familiar were haunting the young gentleman. Sometimes he and Paul Choinsky and Landlord Dombrowski thought they saw that light seeping out of cracks in the sealed loft above the young gentleman's room but they had all agreed not to talk about that. However, it would be better for the gentleman to take another room and get a crucifix from some good priest, like Father Iwenaki. As the man rambled on, Gilman felt a nameless panic clutch at his throat. He knew that Joe must have been half drunk when he came home the night before, yet the mention of a violet light in the garret window was of frightful import. It was a lambent glow of this sort which had always played about the old woman and the small furry thing, in those lighter, sharper dreams which prefaced his plunge into unknown abysses, and the thought that a wakeful second person could see the dream luminance was utterly beyond sane harborage. Yet where had the fellow got such an odd notion? Had he himself talked as well as walked around the house in his sleep? No, Joe said, he had not. But he must check up on this. Perhaps Frank Elwood could tell him something, though he hated to ask. Fever, wild dreams, somnambulism, illusions of sounds, 
a pole toward a point in the sky, and now a suspicion of insane sleep-talking. He must stop studying, see a nerve specialist, and take himself in hand. When he climbed to the second story, he paused at Elwood's door but saw that the other youth was out. Reluctantly, he continued up to his garret room and sat down in the dark. His gaze was still pulled to the southward, but he also found himself listening intently for some sound in the closed loft above, and half imagining that an evil violet light seeped down through an infinitesimal crack in the low, slanting ceiling. That night, as Gilman slept, the violet light broke upon him with heightened intensity, and the old witch and small furry thing getting closer than ever before, mocked him with inhuman squeals and devilish gestures. He was glad to sink into the vaguely roaring twilight abysses, though the pursuit of that iridescent bubble congeries and that kaleidoscopic little polyhedron was menacing and irritating. Then came the shift as vast converging planes of a slippery-looking substance loomed above and below him, a shift which ended in a flash of delirium and a blaze of unknown alien light in which yellow, carmine, and indigo were madly and inextricably blended. He was half lying on a high, fantastically balustrated terrace above a boundless jungle of outlandish, incredible peaks, balanced plains, domes, minarets, horizontal disks poised on pinnacles and numberless forms of still greater wildness some of stone and some of metal, which glittered gorgeously in the mixed, almost blistering glare from a polychromatic sky. Looking upward, he saw three stupendous disks of flame, each a different hue, and at different heights above an infinitely distant curving horizon of low mountains. Behind him, tiers of higher terraces towered aloft as far as he could see. The city below stretched away to the limits of vision, and he hoped that no sound would well up from it. The pavement from which he easily raised himself was a veined, polished stone beyond his power to identify, and the tiles were cut in bizarre angled shapes, which struck him as less asymmetrical than based on some unearthly symmetry whose laws he could not comprehend. The balustrade was chest-high, delicate, and fantastically wrought. All along the rail were ranged at short intervals little figures of grotesque design and exquisite workmanship. They, like the whole balustrade, seemed to be made of some sort of shining metal whose color could not be guessed in the chaos of mixed effulgences, and their nature utterly defied conjecture. They represented some ridged, barrel-shaped objects with thin horizontal arms radiating spoke-like from a central ring and with vertical knobs or bulbs projecting from the head and base of the barrel. Each of these knobs was the hub of a system of five long, flat, triangularly tapering arms arranged around it like the arms of a starfish, nearly horizontal but curving slightly away from the central barrel. The base of the bottom knob was fused to the long railing with so delicate a point of contact that several figures had been broken off and were missing. The figures were about four and a half inches in height, while the spiky arms gave them a maximum diameter of about two and a half inches. When Gilman stood up, the tiles felt hot to his bare feet. He was wholly alone, and his first act was to walk to the balustrade and looked dizzily down at the endless, cyclopean city almost 2,000 feet below. As he listened, he thought a rhythmic confusion of faint musical pipings covering a wide tonal range welled up from the narrow streets beneath, and he wished he might discern the denizens of the place. The sight turned him giddy after a while, so that he would have fallen to the pavement had he not clutched instinctively at the lustrous balustrade. His right hand fell on one of the projecting figures, the touch seeming to steady him slightly. It was too much, however, for the exotic delicacy of the metalwork, and the spiky figure snapped off under his grasp. Still half-dazed, he continued to clutch it as his other hand seized a vacant space on the smooth railing. 
But now his oversensitive ears caught something behind him, and he looked back across the level terrace. Approaching him softly, though without apparent furtiveness, were five figures, two of which were the sinister old woman and the fanged furry little animal. The other three were what sent him unconscious, for they were living entities about eight feet high, shaped precisely like the spiky images of the balustrade, and propelling themselves by a spider-like wriggling of their lower set of starfish arms. Gilman awoke in his bed, drenched by a cold perspiration, and with a smarting sensation on his face, hands, and feet. Springing to the floor, he washed and dressed in frantic haste, as if it were necessary for him to get out of the house as quickly as possible. He did not know where he wished to go, but felt that once more he would have to sacrifice his classes. The odd pole toward that spot in the sky between Hydra and Argo had abated, but another of even greater strength had taken its place. Now he felt that he must go north, infinitely north. He dreaded to cross the bridge that gave a view of the desolate island in the Miskatonic, so went over the Peabody Avenue bridge. Very often he stumbled, for his eyes and ears were chained to an extremely lofty point in the blank blue sky. After about an hour, he got himself under better control and saw that he was far from the city. All around him stretched the bleak emptiness of salt marshes, while the narrow road ahead led to Innsmouth, that ancient, half-deserted town which Arkham people were so curiously unwilling to visit. Though the northward pole had not diminished, he resisted it as he had resisted the other pole, and finally found that he could almost balance the one against the other. Plotting back to town and getting some coffee at a soda fountain, he dragged himself into the public library and browsed aimlessly among the lighter magazines. Once he met some friends who remarked how oddly sunburned he looked, but he did not tell them of his walk. At three o'clock, he took some lunch at a restaurant, noting, meanwhile, that the pole had either lessened or divided itself. After that, he killed the time at a cheap cinema show, seeing the inane performance over and over again without paying any attention to it. About nine at night, he drifted homeward and shuffled into the ancient house. Joe Mazurowicz was whining unintelligible prayers, and Gilman hastened up into his own garret chamber without pausing to see if Elwood was in. It was when he turned on the feeble electric light that the shock came. At once he saw there was something on the table which did not belong there, and a second look left no room for doubt. Lying on its side, for it could not stand up alone, was the exotic, spiky figure which in his monstrous dream he had broken off the fantastic balustrade. No detail was missing. The ridged, barrel-shaped center, the thin, radiating arms, the knobs at each end, and the flat, slightly outward-curving starfish arms spreading from those knobs, all were there. In the electric light, the February seemed to be a kind of iridescent gray veined with green, and Gilman could see amidst his horror and bewilderment that one of the knobs ended in a jagged break, corresponding to its former point of attachment to the dream railing. Only his tendency toward a day's stupor prevented him from screaming aloud. This fusion of dream and reality was too much to bear. Still dazed, he clutched at the spiky thing and staggered downstairs to landlord Dombrowski's quarters. The whining prayers of the superstitious loom fixer were still sounding through the moldy halls, but Gilman did not mind them now. The landlord was in and greeted him pleasantly. No, he had not seen that thing before and did not know anything about it. But his wife had said she found a funny tin thing in one of the beds when she fixed the rooms at noon, and maybe that was it. Dombrowski called her and she waddled in. Yes, that was the thing. She had found it in the young gentleman's bed, on the side next to the wall. It had looked very queer to her, but of course the young gentleman had lots of queer things in his room. Books and curios and pictures and markings on paper. She certainly knew nothing about it. So Gilman climbed upstairs again in mental turmoil. 
convinced that he was either still dreaming or that his somnambulism had run to incredible extremes and led him to depredations in unknown places. Where had he got this outre thing? He did not recall seeing it in any museum in Arkham. It must have been somewhere, though. And the sight of it, as he snatched it in his sleep, must have caused the odd dream picture of the balustrated terrace. Next day, he would make some very guarded inquiries. And perhaps see the nerve specialist. Meanwhile, he would try to keep track of his somnambulism. As he went upstairs and across the garret hall, he sprinkled about some flour which he had borrowed, with a frank admission as to its purpose, from the landlord. He had stopped at Elwood's door on the way, but had found all dark within. Entering his room, he placed the spiky thing on the table and lay down in complete mental and physical exhaustion without pausing to undress. From the closed loft, above the slanting ceiling, he thought he heard a faint scratching and padding, but he was too disorganized even to mind it. That cryptical pull from the north was getting very strong again, though it seemed now to come from a lower place in the sky. In the dazzling violet light of dream, the old woman and the fanged furry thing came again, and with a greater distinctness than on any former occasion. This time they actually reached him, and he felt the crone's withered claws clutching at him. He was pulled out of bed and into empty space, and for a moment, he saw the twilight amorphousness of the vague abysses seething around him. But that moment was very brief, for presently he was in a crude, windowless little space with rough beams and planks rising to a peak just above his head and with a curious slanting floor underfoot. Propped level on that floor were low cases full of books of every degree of antiquity and disintegration. And in the center were a table and bench, both apparently fastened in place. Small objects of unknown shape and nature were ranged on the tops of the cases, and in the flaming violet light, Gilman thought he saw a counterpart of the spiky image which had puzzled him so horribly. On the left, the floor fell abruptly away, leaving a black triangular gulf out of which, after a second's dry rattling, there presently climbed the hateful little furry thing with the yellow fangs and bearded human face. The evilly grinning beldame still clutched him, and beyond the table stood a figure he had never seen before. A tall, lean man of dead black coloration, but without the slightest sign of negroid features, wholly devoid of either hair or beard, and wearing as his only garment a shapeless robe of some heavy black fabric. His feet were indistinguishable because of the table and bench, but he must have been shod since there was a clicking whenever he changed positions. The man did not speak and bore no trace of expression on his small, regular features. He merely pointed to a book of prodigious size which lay open on the table while the beldame thrust a huge gray quill into Gilman's right hand. Over everything was a pall of intensely maddening fear and the climax was reached when the furry thing ran up the dreamer's clothing to his shoulders and then down his left arm, finally biting him sharply on the wrist just below his cuff. As the blood spurted from this wound, Gilman lapsed into a faint. He waked on the morning of the 22nd with a pain in his left wrist and saw that his cuff was brown with dried blood. His recollections were very confused, but the scene with the black man in the unknown space stood out vividly. The rats must have bitten him as he slept, giving rise to the climax of that frightful dream. Opening the door, he saw that the flower on the corridor floor was undisturbed except for the huge prints of the loudish fellow who roomed at the other end of the garret. So he had not been sleepwalking this time. But something would have to be done about those rats. He would speak to the landlord about them. Again, he tried to stop up the hole at the base of the slanting wall, wedging in a candlestick which seemed of about the right size. 
His ears were ringing horribly, as if with the residual echoes of some horrible noise heard in dreams. As he bathed and changed clothes, he tried to recall what he had dreamed after the scene in the violet-lit in space, but nothing definite would crystallize in his mind. That scene itself must have corresponded to the sealed loft overhead, which had begun to attack his imagination so violently, but later impressions were faint and hazy. There were suggestions of the vague twilight abysses and of still vaster, blacker abysses beyond them, abysses in which all fixed suggestions were absent. He had been taken there by the bubble conjuries and the little polyhedron which always dogged him, but they, like himself, had changed to wisps of mist in this farther void of ultimate blackness. Something else had gone on ahead, a larger wisp, which now and then condensed into nameless approximations of form, and he thought that their progress had not been in a straight line, but rather along the alien curves and spirals of some ethereal vortex which obeyed laws unknown to the physics and mathematics of any conceivable cosmos. Eventually, there had been a hint of vast, leaping shadows of a monstrous half-acoustic pulsing and of the thin, monotonous piping of an unseen flute. But that was all. Gilman decided he had picked up that last conception from what he had read in the Necronomicon about the mindless entity Azathoth, which rules all time and space from a black throne at the center of chaos. When the blood was washed away, the wrist wound proved very slight, and Gilman puzzled over the location of the two tiny punctures. It occurred to him that there was no blood on the bedspread where he had lain, which was very curious in view of the amount on his skin and cuff. He had been sleepwalking within his room, and had the rat bitten him as he sat in some chair or paused in some less rational position. He looked in every corner for brownish drops or stains, but did not find any. He had better, he thought, sprinkle flour within the room as well as outside the door, though after all, no further proof of his sleepwalking was needed. He knew he did walk, and the thing to do now was to stop it. He must ask Frank Elwood for help. This morning, the strange poles from space seemed lessened, though they were replaced by another sensation even more inexplicable. It was a vague, insistent impulse to fly away from his present situation, but held not a hint of the specific direction in which he wished to fly. As he picked up the strange spiky image on the table, he thought the older northward pole grew a trifle stronger, but even so, it was wholly overruled by the newer and more bewildering urge. He took the spiky image down to Elwood's room, steeling himself against the winds of the loom fixer which welled up from the ground floor. Elwood was in, thank heaven, and appeared to be stirring about. There was time for a little conversation before leaving for breakfast and college, so Gilman hurriedly poured forth an account of his recent dreams and fears. His host was very sympathetic and agreed that something ought to be done. He was shocked by his guest's drawn, haggard aspect and noticed the queer, abnormal-looking sunburn which others had remarked during the past week. There was not much, though, that he could say. He had not seen Gilman on any sleepwalking expedition, and had no idea what the curious image could be. He had, though, heard the French-Canadian who lodged just under Gilman talking to Mizerwicks one evening. They were telling each other how badly they dreaded the coming of Walpurgis night. Now only a few days off, and were exchanging pitying comments about the poor, doomed young gentleman. Des Rochers, the fellow under Gilman's room, had spoken of nocturnal footsteps shod and unshod, and of the violet light he saw one night when he had stolen fearfully up to peer through Gilman's keyhole. He had not dared to peer, he told Mazurwicks, after he had glimpsed that light through the cracks around the door. There had been soft talking, too, and as he began to describe it, his voice had sunk to an inaudible whisper. Elwood could not imagine what had set these superstitious creatures gossiping, but supposed their imaginations had been roused by Gilman's late hours 
and somnolent walking and talking on the one hand, and by the nearness of traditionally feared May Eve on the other hand. That Gilman talked in his sleep was plain, and it was obviously from Desrochet's keyhole listenings that the delusive notion of the violet dreamlight had got abroad. These simple people were quick to imagine they had seen any odd thing they had heard about. As for a plan of action, Gilman had better move down to Elwood's room and avoid sleeping alone. Elwood would, if awake, rouse him whenever he began to talk or rise in his sleep. Very soon, too, he must see the specialist. Meanwhile, they would take the spiky image around to the various museums and to certain professors, seeking identification and slating that it had been found in a public rubbish can. Also, Dombrowski must attend to the poisoning of those rats in the walls. Braced up by Elwood's companionship, Yeoman attended classes that day. Strange urges still tugged at him, but he could sidetrack them with considerable success. During a free period, he showed the queer image to several professors, all of whom were intensely interested, though none of them could shed any light upon its nature or origin. That night, he slept on a couch which Elwood had had the landlord bring to the second-story room, and for the first time in weeks was wholly free from disquieting dreams. But the feverishness still hung on and the wines of the loom fixer were an unnerving influence. During the next few days, Gilman enjoyed an almost perfect immunity from morbid manifestations. He had, Elwood said, showed no tendency to talk or rise in his sleep, and meanwhile, the landlord was putting rat poison everywhere. The only disturbing element was the talk among the superstitious foreigners whose imaginations had become highly excited. Mazurowicz was always trying to make him get a crucifix, and finally forced one upon him which he said had been blessed by the good father Iwaniki. Desrochet, too, had something to say. In fact, he insisted that cautious steps had sounded in the now vacant room above him on the first and second nights of Gilman's absence from it. Paul Choinsky thought he heard sounds in the halls and on the stairs at night, and claimed that his door had been softly tried, while Mrs. Dombrowski vowed she had seen Brown Jenkin for the first time since All Hallows. But such naive reports could mean very little, and Gilman let the cheap metal crucifix hang idly from a knob on his host's dresser. For three days, Gilman and Elwood canvassed the local museums in an effort to identify the strange spiky image, but always without success. In every quarter, however, interest was intense, for the utter alienage of the thing was a tremendous challenge to scientific curiosity. One of the small radiating arms was broken off and subjected to chemical analysis. Professor Ellery found platinum, iron, and tellurium in the strange alloy, but mixed with these were at least three other apparent elements of high atomic weight, which chemistry was absolutely powerless to classify. Not only did they fail to correspond with any known element, but they did not even fit the vacant places reserved for probable elements in the periodic system. The mystery remains unsolved to this day. Though the image is on exhibition at the Museum of Miskatonic University. Thanks for listening, and I hope you'll join me for part three of The Dreams in the Witch House on episode 14. The Dreams in the Witch House was written by H.P. Lovecraft. The Dread Familiar was created by Joel Hackett. Thanks for listening. Good night. <laughs>